Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. First of all, I would like to say thank you uh, to the organizers for making it possible for me to give this short lecture today. For me, it's a great honor to be able to speak among such outstanding scholars and to share my thoughts with this distinguished audience. If I want to define myself, uh, I can say that I'm a copyright lawyer in the classical sense of the word. So in practice, I work as a copyright advisor for authors and the CMOs of the copyright holders. As mind is often defined by one's chair, my theoretical considerations are basically shaped from the point of view of the copyright holders. I hold it important to set it down here as in the topic discussed in my presentation today, mostly is the point of view of the public or that of the users that are in focus of analysis. However, I will follow the path of the uh, previous presentation, interpreting the platforms as a brand new phenomenon in relation to copyright. It's often said that the challenges to copyright system always come from the side of technology. In fact, the connection between copyright and technology, technology is much deeper than this provocative one. Perhaps it's not an exaggeration to say that the original concept of copyright was evoked by technology. Printing as a technological reform made it possible to effectively share written ideas with the masses of people. The demand for someone to control the destiny of the work and to maintain this controlling position for a generally defined longer period the, uh, may have arisen owing to the fact that printing made it possible to share ideas on a much larger scale. It was technology that brought copyright to life. It changed publishing business models, enabling the change of thinking in society, which culminated in enlightenment, creating copyright as we know it. Copyright, as it was formed at that time, reflected the idea of private property. It wasn't a pure coincidence. A key element of our present concept of property the absolute and independent control over the subject of property originated from that period. The fact that copyright is a monopoly and property-like, exclusive and absolute right was resulted not only by the need for controlling publications, but also by people becoming equal and unlimited owners of things under their domain. Only after this first step, can technology be regarded as a social phenomenon opposing copyright, posing a continuous challenge to it, a phenomenon which as a challenge is continuously urging it to renew and in general to expand and to push the limits of protection further. This effect can be observed in the past 150 years in the case of each new technology which enabled works to be transmitted to the audience in a new way. The invention of a film, the birth, the birth of gramophone, the radio and the television all induced authors to expand their monopoly on the new uses connected to these more and more modern technologies. The invention of technologies of these technologies helped authors transmit their works to the audience on very new ways. Technological development expanded the scope of their exclusive rights, which in turn created opportunity for them to gain income from these new areas. Various legal instruments have helped to maintain the viability of this monopolistic right. Even if a user comes into contact with several right holders, or a right holder comes into contact with several users, by the construction of the system of collective rights management, the exclusive rights and the monopoly could be maintained. The social and cultural changes brought about by emerging means of mass entertainment 
had a tremendous impact on the consumption, consumption of culture and its consumers. It also affected copyright as the monopolistic position and the related exclusive rights proved to be unmanageable in such cases as private copying on blanket carriers or the reprographic reproduction. The exclusive right was mutilated in radical way as it was the controlling element of copyright that was abolished. Concerning mass, mass copying, it was not the right to get remuneration that authors lost, but their right to grant user license, which implied losing the power to decide on granting user licenses before the users take place. When it became possible to share works on the internet, it might have seemed that the earlier strongly hierarchic system of the classical markets of works collapsed and works could be transmitted to the audience directly without any intermediaries. The sudden possibility threatened to wipe out earlier norms. 20 years ago, many scholars envisioned an internet without rules and limits. Copyright was challenged in all its major elements by technology. The role of those who created the works changed. On the one hand, the number of non-professional creators grew considerably, who didn't intend to participate actively in the developments of the markets operated by copyright. On the other hand, these professional or semi-professional authors got closer to their audience, having found numerous direct methods of bringing their works to the audience, although they couldn't completely replace the intermediaries. The role of simple art-loving audience also changed, partly because due to their numerous technological activities, they also become users in the sense of copyright. Another reason for this change was that it became easier for them to discover their creative instincts by taking the opportunity provided by the new technology, as has already been mentioned. The intermediaries of works who were responsible for the creation of monopolistic copyright also underwent major changes. Perhaps it's not exaggerated to state that this transformation had the most serious implications of all in relation to copyright. It was not only traditional distributors who had to adapt their business models to the new technological environment. It took a decade while the publishers of sound recordings as right holders fought a giant battle with the operators of file sharing systems to learn that the fastest possible digitization of the repertoire and setting up authorized platforms can provide an acceptable solution if they want to survive. Book publishing companies were also slow to understand that ebooks or streamed books may be the format of the future, although printed books have not gone out of fashion so much as CDs. Perhaps today it can be stated that these distributors have found the formats which help them integrate their own activities into the new business models. The new type of intermediaries, or using a more precise expression, the online gatekeepers didn't have to adapt their former models, but it was clear at the outset that they wouldn't fit in the traditional frame of the copyright law. Their activity was regulated 20 years ago, both in Europe and in the US, in such a way that it cannot even be determined whether they can be considered users in the sense of copyright. Anyway, an exceptionally strong regime was created limiting responsibility in their favor, whose primary result was that these distributors intermediaries developed extremely fast and almost gained a monopoly, expanding their market influence, not over some territorial markets, but over continent-sized areas, dictating the conditions for copyright holders and the former distributors, and even for the audience enjoying the works. 
it can clearly be seen that it's a stronger monopoly that authors have ever had, as their monopoly is not a legal one in its nature, but it's a clear market monopoly. The answer to the question, that's why, concerning whether they can consider uh, users is no, they can't. In traditional copyright regime, the activity of the user is usually an inten intentional and deliberate activity and not an unintentional and unconscious action. The e-commerce intermediaries have changed a lot in the past 20 years. In the early 20s, they might not have known the contents that were transmitted through their systems due to the stage of technological development then, but this situation has considerably, uh, but this situation has changed considerably by now. Although they are still not obliged to apply any preliminary filtering solution, they generally able to follow that they provide means to share contents under copyright protection and they arrange this. That is the reason why the technological advancement and the further development of the business model may raise the question again as for whether they can be considered users in the classical copyright sense of the word. The safe harbor system of intermediaries responsibility created the illusion for a long time that keeping them out of the copyright regime would influence the inside balance of copyright system and its sustainability. However, it became clear quite soon that they may only differ from classical distributors with respect of their knowledge about these user activities. By keeping themselves out of the system through limiting their liability, they disintegrated the system from outside after all, as user strong and objective liability for rights infringement constitutes an essential part of exclusive copyright. If the infringement's liability is strongly limited, it eventually eliminates the deepest sense of the exclusive authorization right. Therefore, in my opinion, the goal achieved in the European Union by passing the DSM directive is two-phased. It's an important step forward that it has been confirmed that content sharing service providers themselves are considered as users. Only this declaration could, could provide a legal basis for the user to be obliged to get a license. It's obvious in the frame of copyright. The fact that the DSM directive declared in 2019 that content sharing service providers are regarded as users, persons making content available to the public, cannot be evaluated as an absolute victory for the right orders. Why? The system of safe harbor rules of service providers has not disappeared completely. It's only changed. It will be a key issue in the future whether the barriers of the limitation of liability of content sharing service providers will force them to seek the opportunity to conclude agreements with the right orders or not. If they choose to follow the other way by trying to meet the requirements of the limitation of liability, then no great pro progress will be made by classifying them as copyright users. If the user chooses to obtain authorization according to the general principle of the DSM directive, their license will cover the authorization of the content sharing of the end user. Thus, due to the double license, the end user doesn't have to get license anymore. It, de facto, transfers the obligation from the end user to the content sharing service provider, solving the hopeless problem of law enforcement against the end users. Moreover, the DSM directive applies an extended gradual mechanism for those situations where, according to some parameters of the early stages of business, the content sharing service provider may be exempt from the liability for failing to obtain an authorization in accordance, in accordance with an even more lenient system of limitation of liability. 
in traditional copyright regimes, failing to get a license constitutes an objective liability for infringement. The special construction that any use incurs an obligation of concluding an agreement raises the question whether any meaningful progress has been made to strengthen copyright by DSM Directive. Leaving a strong limitation of liability of the user in the regime may seem to undermine the system of law enforcement fatally. The DSM Directive exonerates service providers from liability even in those cases when they don't manage to conclude an agreement despite having done their best to conclude the agreement and to remove any illegal content as soon as possible. While this system of points of view would only be a factor influencing the degree of sanctions, here it has been elevated to a position excluding any liability by itself. Taking all this into consideration, it can be stated that by acquiring license granting rights for the activities of content sharing service providers, authors have not gained as much strength as earlier by expanding the domain of copyright to new technologies or new uses. As the objective of copyright infringements of users will be judged based upon a new type of regime of limiting liability which reduces the rights of the right holders to simply demanding the removal of the content. In my opinion, monopolistic copyright has sustained serious internal bonds so the arrival of platforms is not only another challenge posed to copyright by numerous technologies. It's feared that incorporating limitations of liability into the copyright regime is nothing sort of towing the wooden horse into Troy. Thank you very much.